young fella in church, and I grew up in church. As a child in church, I used to hear some great stories of what God was doing. I can remember listening to missionaries tell stories and others. I remember, for those of us old enough to remember what the Cold War was, how many of you do remember what the Cold War was? That was, of course, when Iceland and Alaska were heavily at war. <laughs> the Cold War had to do with our political system and communism and the United States. And during the Cold War, in many parts of what was called the Iron Curtain, or the part of Europe that was under the dominion of the Soviet Union, it was illegal to have Bibles. And there was a fellow who, his ministry was smuggling Bibles into the areas where uh, the atheism of communism made it illegal for folks to happen. And he wrote a book called God Smuggler. And one of the stories, he was in line, his, he was driving a car going across the border, and as he was getting ready to go through the inspection at the border, the fella in the car in front of him was dragged out of his car and severely beaten because of contraband. And here he sits with a trunk full of Bibles. And miraculously, one of the uh, border guards waves him on. I guess while they're beating this one guy, they didn't want the line to get too long. They wave this guy through, and he drives through because he had prayed, Lord, you made blind eyes see. Today, I'm asking you to make seeing eyes blind. And he was allowed to take those Bibles into those Soviet bloc countries uninhibited. Some of you may remember the name uh, David Wilkerson. <clears throat> and uh, there was a book and a movie called The Cross and the Switchblade. David Wilkerson, in the 60s, went into a part of New York City that was very dangerous. It was gang-laden, it was drug-laden, and it was a place where you could lose your life if you were in the wrong place. He goes into that place because he believes God wants him to go in there with the gospel to preach the gospel, the good news, for the salvation of the lost where drugs, prostitution, and gangs really rule. Uh, I, there was one case where he actually went in, he fell asleep in his car, he woke up, and the wheels had been stolen while he was sleeping in. <laughs> Some of you may have been in parts of Philadelphia and other places where that might happen to you too. Of course, nowadays they might uh, sell your blood. <laughs> uh, dangerous places. Uh, he went in, and there was a gang leader named Nicky Cruz. Nicky Cruz was a very powerful young man, a very uh, angry young man. And through the ministry of David Wilkerson, he saw Nicky Cruz give his life to Jesus Christ. And it turned him around. And through that, a ministry evolved with David Wilkerson that today is called Teen Challenge. That is today the most successful drug recovery ministry or any drug-related program in the nation. It has the highest rate of success anywhere. And it was because one man took God at his word. In John chapter 14, if you will look there with me, in John chapter 14, Jesus is gathered in the upper room with his disciples, and as he shares with them in verse 12 of chapter 14, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Now I'm reading here out of the uh, New King James. And greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father, to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Imagine for a moment that he really means that. 
Let's ask God to bless the word. Father, I do pray today that you would bless the word. And God, that as we open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that we may not only understand, but God, that we may grasp the promise and learn, Lord, how to apply this effectively in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, there <laughs> have been, as I shared with the kids, I shared them briefly a story of how we were on our way down here. We were living in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, just a few miles north of the city of Philadelphia. We were traveling down. We were on our way here to do, um, I was doing an internship in this area. We would leave on Saturday morning around 6 o'clock. We would drive here. I would uh, put in 20 hours of ministry, and then Sunday night we would drive home. We'd get home about midnight or thereabouts. We were driving a little old Honda Civic wagon. Carol had found this car and paid the sterling sum of $400 for our lively transportation. Uh, you know, we've had a few cars where changing the air and the tires was a major investment. And this little car, it had a lot of miles on it, but it was just ideal what we needed. It was comfortable. It was small enough so that in the evenings we could, as we were driving back, the kids could actually fold down the back seat and sleep on the way home because Jennifer was in uh, kindergarten or the first grade, and we were concerned about her not getting enough sleep. And so, but it had a couple of weird things, and that one day it was doing something that it always did, and I generally knew what to do. And uh, we, long story short, we ended up stranded on the northeast extension, not enough money to get us or the car off the highway, and we prayed for God to start the car. I remember after I prayed out loud, I looked in the back, and my daughter was sitting back there about six years old, eyes as big as saucers, looking at me after I said, Lord, start our car. And when I said, Amen, and the first thought I had was, what if it doesn't start? What is my daughter going to think? And the second thought was, dummy, if you're going to pray and ask God to start the car, give it a try. <laughs> but you understand my dilemma. And when I started that car, when he started that car, I turned the key. He started that car. I want you to know that that moment became a seminal moment in my daughter's spiritual life. Because of her times when she would be scared about this or that, as young girls and teenagers will be. And I would say, do you remember the day that we asked God to start that car? And she said, yeah, Daddy, I remember. You know what, if I'd have had a great car, I would never have that story to tell. And my daughter would have never had that great lesson. The Bible says, in all things, give thanks. There has never been a miracle that wasn't preceded by a catastrophe or a crisis. They always saw. That's what makes them miraculous. A few years later, we were driving an old Volkswagen van. Some of you have heard this story, some of you have not. We were coming back from Ohio, which actually we're going to be there again, at Lord willing, by the next Sunday. As we come back through St. Louis, we're going to have a little mini reunion with my mom's side of the family. It's what we were doing. It was 1988, I think. We're coming this way, Carol, myself, uh, Jennifer, Matthew, Stephen, and Veronica, and uh, Linda's uh, son and daughter, and we're driving a, an old Volkswagen van. I love that old thing. Uh, you know, we weren't hippies, but this thing, it was brown and beige on top and had a big, ugly brown spot on the front where the tire was supposed to be. We could always find it. <laughs> We're driving that thing across uh, the interstate, coming back. We're south of Cleveland. I'm driving right along. Carol looks back, and she said, what did you do? And I said, what do you mean? I didn't do anything. She said, look, I looked behind me, and I could not see behind me for the smoke billowing out of the back of this thing. I thought it was on fire. I got out. I should have gotten the kids. I did later. <laughs> It was coming out of the exhaust. If you know anything about mechanics, it's not supposed to do that. We pulled off at the nearest place we could and went into one of those uh, plazas that's there. And this thing was huge. It was like a stadium. We pulled off. 
When I got out, the smoke just came and enveloped this thing. I mean, it was so thick, you couldn't believe it. People looking at me like I had done something very inappropriate. We didn't, as was often the case, we didn't have enough money to get us home without that thing, and we didn't have enough money to get it off of the highway. And so I went into the closest thing I could find as a prayer stall. It was in the men's room. <laughs> I went into the men's room, shut the door behind me, and I just lit my hand and said, God, I don't even know what to ask for. I need a miracle. That's it. I need a miracle. We were hundreds of miles away from home. I walked out having no clue what to do. As soon as I walked out, I looked over, and Carol was standing about 100 feet away, and on either side of her was my mom's brother and his wife, hundreds of miles away from home. Incidentally, they were not believers. And I walked up to them and I said, I don't know if you've ever been a miracle before, but I just went in there and asked for one, and I came out, and here you are. And those dear folks followed us as far as they could, until I poured so much oil in that thing, I, I had actually gone through 13 quarts of oil. That's more than it holds. <laughs> and I had smoked up all of eastern Ohio and half of western Pennsylvania. Finally got to State College, and that was it. I was pouring one quart in, and it's pouring out as fast as I can pour it in, and it's not coming out from where it's supposed to. But those folks allowed us, we piled in the back seat of a very small car, and I had Jennifer on one knee and Veronica on the other, and Carol had Matthew and Stephen, and we're packed into a two-seat place. We felt we would be handicapped by the time we got home, but we got home, because God answered prayer. Amen. You know, of all the times I've heard folks tell stories, I always thought, you know, it's great to hear those stories. But I wanted to be able to tell my own. Because I wanted to know what it was like to have a relationship with God where I believed that if I bowed my head and asked for God to do something for me that he really would. And I think one of our problems in our church, not just this church here, but our church, the whole shebang of this Western church, is that we have learned to not expect God to do great things. We become conditioned because we don't need much. We have everything we need almost all the time. And so we don't know what it's like to cry out to God in great need and see God do great things. In this passage where Jesus is talking, there are some things that I think are important. First of all, we need to understand that there is a criteria for how we pray and how prayers are answered. First of all, there is a purpose for God doing miracles. In the early days of the apostolic church, the Bible itself had not been completed. And the authority of those disciples was dependent on God giving them miraculous signs that went with them so that when they preached the gospel, they saw the miraculous signs, and the people believed. In fact, Jesus himself said that that is why he did miracles. And John, if you still have your Bible open, and that'd be a good idea today, because we're going to stay right in John's gospel. In John chapter 5, verse 36, Jesus said, I have testimony that is weightier, or more important, than that of John the Baptist. For the works the Father has given me to finish, the very works I am doing, testify that the Father has sent me. Jesus said that his miracles were to verify that he was the Son of God and that he was doing what God wanted him to do. In John chapter 6, verses 27 and following, do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. 
They then ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus said, the works of God is this to believe in the one he has sent. Jesus Christ said that for us to do the works of the Father, that is why he grants to us answer to prayer. That is why he came. It is why God gave him the, op the opportunity to perform the miracles that he performed. He said he came to bring glory to the Father and to testify of the power and authority that God the Father had given to Jesus. In John chapter 10, verse 25, Jesus said, The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. In John 10, 37 and 38, If I do not do, if I do, not do the works of my Father, do not believe in me. But if I do, though you don't believe in me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I am in him. Jesus' miracles verified his identity and his mission, that he was the Son of God and that his work was to do the will of the Father. In this passage in John 14, in verse 11, just before this, Jesus said, Believe me when I say that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. These things were to verify in the eyes of God's own people who Jesus is, what his nature was, and that his name was great. Jesus came to his own. He came to those who were supposed to recognize and to know who God the Father is. He said, if I come and I do the works of the Father, believe in me. But if you won't believe in me, at least believe that the works the Father is doing in me testify that I am in him. Jesus' miracles were not parlor tricks. You remember when Jesus was arrested and when he was taken before Herod. Herod's response to Jesus was, Oh, goody, do some of those tricks I've been hearing about. Jesus would not dignify that with an answer. Because Jesus didn't come to do tricks like some Vegas magician. He came into the world to preach the good news of God and the salvation that had come through him and through his shed blood. He didn't do his miracles to impress. He didn't do the miracles just so he could become famous. He did the miracles so people would believe. Believe who he was. That he is who he said he was. That he came to do what he said he would do. And his resurrection from the dead was the great sign to all that Jesus' testimony was absolutely true. There are principles when it comes to being, uh, to having the power of answered prayer. One, answered prayer is reserved for God's children. The only thing God re, uh, is required to do for those who are not his is to bring justice against them for their sin. That's what God is required to do. God is love, but God is just. God will judge sin, and he will judge all sin. And it is because of sin that we fear God. He tells us that our sin has separated us from him. And because of sin, the Bible says that God has turned his head away from us. Now that may seem a bit harsh to you, but may I remind you that because God is a judge and he is just, that he is required to judge your sin. 
the fact that he is willing not to look on you is actually an act of mercy and grace because it delays your judgment and gives you an opportunity for grace to come into your life. And so when God turns his head away and he will not hear us, it is a result of sin. And yes, it is a part of judgment, but even in that judgment is grace that allows you a time for repentance. The power of God is reserved for his children. Unlike those who are not his own, to those who are his own, he says that he will not only hear you, but that he will do for you abundantly more than you can ask. And you know what? Even for unbelievers, God allows the rain to fall. He allows them to eat from the abundance that he blesses this earth with. God has said, and Isaiah, he says that he will hear us. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their sin, I will hear them. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. God obligates himself to his own to hear you when you pray. When I am willing to confess my sin, to abandon my sin, and to claim my right as a son of God through Christ Jesus, God says to me, I will hear you. It is also, in, uh, along with reserve for the child of God, the answer to prayer and God's power is primarily for his own glory, not mine and not yours. You see, the world doesn't need to know how great I am. And the world doesn't need to know how great and important you are. But the world desperately needs to know how great and powerful and wonderful God is. And everything that God does, even in us and through us, is designed that we may glorify Him who has died to save us and make us part of his family. And so the key to answer prayer is reserved for his children and it is for his glory. It is to advance his kingdom. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, we are to pray, thy kingdom come. What is the kingdom? There is a part of the kingdom that awaits us in heaven. There is a glorious place where all of the effects and all of the curse of sin is done away with, and it is glory upon glory. But there is also a part of that kingdom that is here and now, because he is the king. He is not just going to be the king. He is the king when he raised victorious over sin and death and established himself. He sat down on a throne and assume the reins of the kingdom of heaven and of God. And he is my king. And so, it is to advance his kingdom. How is his kingdom advanced? Through the testimony of his people, as that testimony provokes faith in those who have not heard and those who have not believed. God uses these things to promote his kingdom, that his kingdom may advance, that lives and souls might be saved. And it must be through Christ in his name according to his will. You see, prayer is not my Christmas list. Prayer is not how I say, God, I wish I had a house like my neighbor, or I wish, I wish I didn't have this lousy car. It's okay to pray for your needs, and if your need is a vehicle, that is fine. But you know what? I'm not just supposed to be saying, God, give me an upgrade. I want the premium package. God's interest in me, God has already promised me all things. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills and wealth in every month. He has already taught me that everything I have need of, he can more than abundantly supply. 
But it must be according to his will because, quite honestly, I don't have sense enough to know what I need or what's good for me. Only God knows that. And so I am to submit my will to that of the Father, and I go to the Father in the name of Christ because he said, I am the only way. And so uh, submitting my will to the Father and in the name of Christ. This fellow that Carol and I are hopefully going to get to visit some friends of ours, that he was a professor of mine in seminary. He and uh, I got to be pretty good friends. He, his wife and Carol became his closest sisters. He had a student before I got there. The fellow's name was Joe. Joe ended up becoming a pastor in New Jersey. There in Jersey, he had a church, and by God's blessing, the church began to grow. They needed parking area. They had some property, but there was a big hill there, and they didn't have the money for the excavation, and then they didn't have the money for the paving. And he began to pray. He said, God, you said that you could move mountains and that we could move mountains by faith. And he began to pray, God, move that mountain. And lo and behold, a fella came to him, a contractor came and said, hey, I need some dirt. And the guy said, here's the deal. How about if you let me have that dirt, I'll get it out of there and we'll pave your parking lot for you. Amen. Yeah. You know, for some of us, uh, there was a fellow that used to come to church here. He's with the Lord now. His name was Homer McMahon. Some of you will remember Homer. Homer was a delightful fellow to be around. Homer was uh, a little on in years. Homer had worked for the CIA. He had been in either taking photographs or interpreting and, and uh, looking and helping figure out what those photographs showed. When he came here, he became a believer, and it was really new. It was almost like watching a child. Homer would get so tickled and excited at what God was doing. And he, he would just sit and laugh and giggle sometimes at what God was doing. Well, Homer was diagnosed with prostate cancer. They found out that it had metastasized from his prostate and gone into his bones. Homer came and we had a uh, prayer service. Uh, in fact, uh, Veronica, Lane and, uh, Linda's daughter, had a prayer and healing service and Homer came. And he said... I've got to go here in a few days. They're going to do an, another scan. They're going to set up my treatment. But let's, I want you to pray for me. And we laid hands on Homer. We began to pray for him. After a little bit of time of praying, he said, I feel tingling all over. I just feel warm. Well, I'll be honest with you. A lot of times in a situation like that, emotion takes over and, and folks, you know, have an emotional response. Homer goes to his appointment. He comes back and he's like a little kid. He says, guess what? He said, my doctor said that my cancer is gone. Amen. And he said that the doctor literally had the results of picture of his tumor from before and another scan that they did after he went back and he held him up and in the before the tumor was there in the after it was gone and it was no longer in his bone marrow. And Homer was thrilled like a little child. And he just couldn't help but rejoice with him. A few days later, Homer had to go to get to see his eye doctor. He had cataracts. He came back like a kid. He said, guess what? I got a bonus. My cataracts are gone. <laughs> Homer was a delightful guy. There was a fellow by the name of Dr. Joe Cassiope. Some of us had the opportunity to go on a mission trip down to Guatemala a number of years ago. It's actually back in 99, prior to 9-11 and all that. We went down, and Dr. Joe would go. He had a nurse to go with him. He had worked out an agreement with a pharmaceutical company, and when we went, Dr. Joe took about $250,000 worth of medicine and did medical clinics in one of the poorest places I've ever seen in my life. Mm. And it was really something to see. Mm. Dr. Joe, we, we would go out and we went up into the mountains to a place where you would have sworn we were in the worst little wilderness. 
that you'd ever seen just right in a jungle. We literally, we got in vans, we literally went through a riverbed. There was no road. I mean, the road stopped, the riverbed went, and you cross that and come back up on a dirt road. And then we went up a hill that I just wasn't sure that those vans were going to go up. We get up there and we stop outside this little hut that had a dirt floor and one family. We get out of these vans, there's like 15 or 20 of us. Somebody blows one of those air horns, like that annoying little horn you hear at football games. And in, within five minutes, there must have been 100 people gathered around that hut. And the nurse would look at the patients and she would triage them and then they would go to see the doctor. The doctor would generally, most of the time, the children had a lot of parasites and worms. Some of them had so many that they couldn't tolerate the medicine. Prior to us going on one of those trips, there was a little boy who was deaf and he was born without any apparatus in his ears to hear. In other words, when you look in the ear canal, all of that stuff that's supposed to give us their hearing was not even there by a birth defect. They brought the child to the group. They began to pray. And as they began to pray, there was one fellow there. His name was Reese. And Reese was a boisterous character. He was from, this, uh, from the eastern shore. And Reese was one of those that when he prayed, it was, oh, Lord, and this and that loud, and people shouting and stuff. And, you know, some of us was like, <laughs> it's not like God's death, it's just the boy, you know? <laughs> well, they prayed over this child, and all of a sudden, because other folks were getting excited and shouting and, and praying, and all of a sudden, the little boy starts to cry, and the little boy's afraid, and they realize the little boy's afraid because he hears them, and it scared him. And for the first time in his life, he could hear and I remember asking the doctor, I said, did you look in his ear to see? And the doctor said, to be honest with you, it didn't even occur to me. He said, I guess I figured at this point, what's the point for whatever, however, God gave this child hearing. A few years later, some of us went to Costa Rica. We were in um, an area that was probably the danger, most dangerous place I've ever been in my life. And we didn't know that, but it was extremely dangerous. It was dangerous enough that when a fire broke out in the school we were working in, that the fire department would not come. There were a thousand children in this school. The structure was adequate, but would certainly burn. And the fire was racing across a field of grass this high and the fire department would not come there because they were afraid. And one police car drove by, slowed down, looked, and drove off. We had no idea what we were in until we were in it. There were, one of the fellows was carrying a money bag because, uh, well, a money belt. Because there, we were told we couldn't have rings or watches or anything because it was too dangerous to have anything like that shown. And so, because you couldn't spend anything larger than a $20 bill, they simply didn't have enough money if you had a 50. The merchants did not have enough money to break a $50 bill. They just didn't have it. And so, anything larger than 20 you could not carry. He was carrying the money for all of us, and he had about $5,000 in 20s around his waist. Now, that was kind of a dangerous thing to ask when we picked the biggest guy that we had, and the one looked like he was the most able. But every afternoon, when we'd get back, he would take that money belt, and he would go to his room, and he would count the money to make sure that it was accounted for each and every day. On a couple of occasions, a need would arise, and we realized we had a little bit more money than we needed. We had enough money to feed ourselves and to take care of ourselves and to get us back to the United States. And a need would come up. And when that need would come up, we would 
gather together and we would talk and we would pray. What should we do? Should we meet this need? And the first time that happened, we decided, yes, we have enough money. We have enough more than we need to get back home. This is a good need. Let's give to this need. And we did. We got back to the place we were staying, and the fellow that was holding the money, he said, Alan, come here a minute. And I walked around, he's standing there with the money, and he looks at me, and he's got this strange look on his face. And I'm thinking, uh-oh. <laughs> and he said, something's wrong. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, we gave away some money today, but it's not gone. It's still here. He counted it out to me, and he said, this is what we gave away, and this was how much we should have, and we still have exactly the amount that we gave away. Another need came up a little bit later, and we did the same thing. We got back after it was all over with, and he said, Alan, come here. I walk into the room, and he's standing there with that same look on his face. He said, we met a need, we gave the money away, but the money is still here. And it got so that we would pass each other and just get kind of a silly grin and say, loaves and fishes. <laughs> there was a pastor there, his name was Walter. Walter, like a lot of the men in that culture, was of small stature. He was a very thin fellow. But he was a mighty man of God. Walter lived in this place where we found out how dangerous it was. That's where Walter felt God called him to be a pastor. Walter lived across the street from a place that was going to be his new church because nobody wanted that house. So many people had been murdered in that house because of drugs and gangs that nobody would live there. And he says, God's going to give me that house and I'm going to make it into a church. Walter was this little guy, and the fellow that was our leader, his name was Danny. Danny was the kind of guy you want with you when you go to a place like that because Danny was so advanced in martial arts that he could have pretty well whipped everybody in this room if he had taken a notion. He was young and strong, and, and thank God he was on our side. But Danny was driving down into this place, getting ready to make the arrangements for us to show up, and the gang surrounded his car, and they came to his door with clubs and with chains and with knives, and I'm talking machete knives. They stopped his vehicle, and he rolled his window down about that far and said, what do you want? And the, one of the gang members said, we want your money. And Danny said, I don't have any. And the gang leader said, then you're in big trouble. And Walter, this little thin, small of stature pastor, looked over at this gang leader and he said, he is with me. And then he said, that gang parted like the Red Sea. Because those people believed in the man of God. This little pastor he needed $400 because he needed back surgery. He was in constant pain. And we looked at the money we had and we realized that $400 he needed was the money his family would need for one month's salary. That's what he made a month. And I'm going to tell you, it's not that different than our, in fact, a refrigerator dinner costs a lot more. And a car cost at least 30% more down there. And this man's family lived on $400 a month. And we looked at the money we had, and we had that $400. And we were able to take that $400 and give it so that Walter could have his surgery and feed his family. And you know what? We didn't have to worry because we'd already seen what God would do if the need was right and if you trust him. Now, truth be told, we gave the money to the other guy because we knew that if we gave it to Walter, he'd give it to somebody else because that's the way he was. God is still in the business of answering prayer. 
He's not out here doing parlor tricks. He's not out here trying to fulfill my Christmas list. But the truth of the matter is that God still works when the use of his power and the answer to prayer furthers his kingdom, acknowledges the lordship of Jesus Christ, and brings glory to God. And the question for us is, when is the last time that God answered a prayer for you in a way that would make a great testimony? You know what? We talk so much about the things that are wrong in our culture. We talk about how things seem to just be going crazy. And Jesus Christ has left this church here. Not just you and me, but his entire church. And he has left us with power. And rather than wring your hands, may I suggest you fold your hands and drop to your knees and call on him who is able to do abundantly, exceedingly, more than you're ever able to ask or even imagine. And uh, for your children and your grandchildren and your lost loved ones and the folks that are in trouble and the folks that are addicted, God still answers prayer. And he will answer those prayers for us. Let's look to the Lord in Our Heavenly Father, you are still a miracle-working God. Your arm is not short. Father, do in us what needs to be done in order that we may see the power of the resurrected Christ alive in your church. Father, we're crying out to you for our children. We're crying out to you for our grandchildren, our loved ones, and so many others. Father, show us what we need to do in order that our life may be ready for the power of God to be revealed. In Jesus' name we pray.